The mission of FSU Coach is to prepare and equip the next generation of coaches and sports professionals with best practices and current research to enable them to pursue excellence. We have two academic programs, the online graduate certificate, which is four classes, and also a 10 class master's in athletic coaching. Our graduate certificate and master's program can be started at any time, either the, the summer, fall, or spring. The types of classes that we offer focus on the athlete as a whole person. We focus on the theory and practice, the research, the helping skills. I came to FSU Coach because I truly believed in the mission and the purpose of the program. I think I have my dream job being a head coach at Florida State, but I know there's always more ways that I can help my athletes and better prepare as a coach. If you're interested in going into coaching or joining the FSU Coach program, I would just say don't even think about it and do it. And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Coaches Clinic, a collaboration between FSU Coach and USYS. My name is Tim Baggers. Today's guest is Vince Gansberg. He is the Director of Coaching Education for United Soccer Coaches. A lot of other titles associated with your name, Vince, but uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and, and let's get started in your presentation. Well, sure. First off, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, it's... Uh... It's an honor to be to have been asked. So thank you. Um, yeah, I live in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, doesn't make me a bad person, but that's where I live. And I work for United Soccer Coaches full time. I started off with the NSCAA. Now we are United Soccer Coaches as a young coach. And um, but before then, I was also a high school teacher and a high school coach uh, for for many years. Left that to become the state director of coaching for. Indiana U Soccer, so therefore I became affiliated with USU Soccer and what they offer because uh, we were members of USYS. Left the director of coaching job to go back into high school and said, what the heck am I doing? I'm, I don't want to be governed by bells and walls anymore. So I went back into soccer full time. When US Soccer asked me to design the F license, which is the first online coaching course for the parent rec recreation coach. So I designed that, um, uh, oversaw the E and the D license curriculums back then, and then uh, taught the C license all over. Did that for about three years, and then I received an opportunity to go work for the NSCAA back then, now United Soccer Coaches, and recently have been uh, promoted to the Director of Coaching Education, uh, which it's it's an honor to, to be um, named that. So, uh, that's the long and short of it. I am a, a dad and also a granddad. So um, congratulations. Yeah, and that's a lot of fun. I get to see my grandchildren this weekend. So, well, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, well, let's get started on what you have to share. And, and just a reminder as well, if you're watching on that, if you have any questions for Vince throughout the presentation, just put it in your chat box and then we'll get to those questions at the end of the session. Okay. Um, hopefully you can see. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so what I'm going to present today is the idea of what's called autonomy supportive coaching practices. And basically, in a, in a nutshell, it's giving players a choice. And it's helping to also create an athlete-centered environment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of get started with the presentation. Um, I guess if there are any questions in the chat box, uh, please feel free to pause me and, and um, ask the questions as we go. So um, just going to kind of go into what is autonomy supportive coaching and uh, how do you kind of implement it? And then most importantly, why it's important. So um, really the autonomy supportive coaching practice, in my opinion, it's 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 a cousin of self-determination theory, where um, I'm sure a lot of people watching this are very familiar with self-determination theory and that, you know, if we can um, inspire competence and, and develop competence um, and make things related or relatable or have relatedness um, and give players autonomy then that helps them become more self-determined or self-motivated. And uh, we, as human beings, we, we basically have these, these needs. We like to control the course of our own lives. Um, we like to be, you know, 
close with peers and also close to what we're trying to achieve. And uh, when we have competence, we have confidence and that leads to confidence. So the idea of autonomy, supportive coaching practices as a, as a soccer coach, it's something that maybe some of you have already done and you just didn't realize it, or maybe this is something that's going to be uh, new and, and um, challenging for you to try and do. So I apologize for the ugliness of this graphic. Um, so a couple of years ago during the pandemic, I took advantage to get my master's degree through Ohio University in recreation and sports science. And we were assigned a textbook in one of the courses called Coaching Better Every Season by Wade Gilbert. And in the textbook, there is this section on autonomy, so supportive coaching behaviors. And it really intrigued me. So before this graphic in the book, there is a story about a, a, a former Scottish rugby coach, national team coach by the name of Gregor Townsend. And he would, uh, when the players would arrive for national team training for the Scottish rugby team, he would schedule in time for them to work on areas that they feel like they needed to work on during practice. And I thought that was actually really kind of unique because a lot of times as coaches, we don't practice, we don't schedule any free time during practice to allow them to work on things they need to work on um, or improve upon. Because a lot of times we, as coaches, we go in with a practice plan and we're going to do this practice plan no matter what. And we expect them to go home and practice independently when we know in reality, a lot of kids don't do that. Um, unfortunately, as much anymore. Although if we can kind of implement some of these strategies, maybe they will want to go home and can and practice on their own to, uh, you know, get more competent um, and, and to, you know, basically get uh, a little bit more confident in what they're doing. So I'm going to talk about providing opportunities, what that looks like, providing choice within boundaries. So it's basically allowing athletes to choose a practice activity from a prepared list. And that's a, that's the key, the key words are prepared list of activities. It's not like you just let them choose anything. So as a coach, you come in with a with a plan in mind, but maybe you're going to say, all right, I'm going to give the players a choice between a few activities as opposed to me imposing my will upon them. Uh, giving rationale uh, for why we're doing what we're doing. I think it's really important because uh, sometimes as players, they don't know why we're doing it. And uh, the why is the center uh, or the bullseye of, of, of the tar target. Acknowledging things, uh, listening, you know, just kind of listening and, and um, being non-defensive, repeating back what they say, uh, rephrasing so they know that you're listening. That's part of this autonomy, supportive coaching behavior. So listening their input, uh, I think. Again, all of this and avoid controlling behaviors, all of this relates to um, creating an athlete centered environment, because when we do that, we find the players a little bit more motivated to come and learn and, and get better. So first thing I'm going to talk about is, is providing opportunities for independent um, work. And so when I read this in the book, I, I started to think, OK, how can I do this? So I'm a high school coach as well, in addition to what I do for United Soccer Coaches. And what we started doing in the high school practice is I gave them uh, 10 minutes to work on what they feel like they needed to work on in the middle of practice, not at the beginning, not at the end, in the middle. And there are a lot of really, uh, there are a lot of great benefits that came out of it. So in the book, that I referenced, Gregor Townsend called it great by choice. You have a choice, you have a chance to be great by choice, meaning that you have a chance to, for the next 10, 15 minutes, he was talking to professional athletes, you have a chance to work on what you feel like you need to work on to get better. You can work on with a, uh, with the, by yourself, you can do it with a teammate, you can do something with teammates. Uh, you can give them boundaries. So, for example, if you do this with little kids, if you say you got 10 minutes to do whatever you want, a lot of them would just go stand and shoot in front of goal and take turns and all that like they like to do before practice. Um, 
uh, if they're not uh, doing play practice play, for example. So you might have to give them boundaries. You might have to say you can do anything besides standing and shooting in front of goal. Um, you can do anything that involves a ball. Uh, so, um, again, it, it's you. I give them ideas. So I might say, uh, you know, hey, you can play soccer tennis with your buddies. If you feel like you need to work on your first touch, you can juggle. If you feel like your footwork needs to be better for defending, then play a little one versus one with somebody. And I put down, down the words pro time in the lower right hand corner because I was presenting this concept and a college coach raised his hands and he, and he said, Vince, he said, we do this with our college program. Uh, we do it in the middle of practice, like you said, and we call it the pro time. So, so they have a chance to develop and become pros. So I have a video clip of me doing this with a whole bunch of kids. This is in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's Grand Park. And I'm going to pause just to verify that you can see my video. Uh, it's not playing, but you can just see it. So I'm going to go and play it. So as we're playing, there's no audio. Um, in the middle, I basically told them, hey, you've got, I think I gave them eight minutes because they were kind of younger. This is an 09 ODP age group. And just to do whatever they feel like they want to do with the ball, they can do it with a teammate. I gave them the parameters. So you'll see, like, for example, the kids on the left, the pairs, they're working on bending the ball. That's an idea that I gave them. I, I give them the ideas. Maybe you want to work on how you bend the ball or how you make it spin sideways. So they're actually practicing in dyads. They're, they're, it's, um, the, so now they can kind of observe how one, each other, one another strikes the ball, and they can learn that way. So we're giving us some autonomy to learn but also some autonomy to improve on what they feel like they need to work on. Um, so it's just, again, you see some kids juggling, you see another pair on the right-hand side striking the ball back and forth. Uh, there was another group that came around. They set up soccer tennis. Uh, they played some soccer tennis because they were familiar with that game. Uh, so there's lots of neat ways. And I've, I've done this with everything as low as eight years old to the high school age player. So oh, that's just a video example. Um, so as we go on with, you know, some of what it is, and, and we talked about earlier about I did about providing choice within boundaries. So as a coach, you have in your mind what you want to work on. You always should have a written plan or and then you should have a, a plan to back up that plan in case something goes awry. But Sometimes you, you go in with, all right, we're going to work on attacking, and uh, but I'm going to give them a choice of a couple activities that they're already familiar with and see what see which one they want to play. Um, you can do this with those youngest five and six-year-olds. This past weekend, I was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, teaching a course, and I gave some five and six-year-olds the choice of, well, do you want to play red light, green light, or do you want to play sharks and minnows? And knowing in my mind that I really wanted to work on dribbling to get forward or dribbling to, you know, to penetrate or just moving the ball forward with, uh, by dribbling, giving them the choice. And they chose, of course, Sharks and Minnows because they, well, they like that game. So, and it didn't bother me that they didn't choose red light, green light. I don't, it didn't bother me because I knew that they chose one of the two options I gave them that worked on what I wanted them to work on. So some examples is basically ask them as a team what they feel like they need to work on to improve and then have a list of activities ready to allow them to pick. There's a high school coach in Massachusetts that does this. He has a list of activities and the kids are familiar with those activities. And he says, I put them on a piece of paper and I put them on the ground and then the kids go and then they choose which of those activities um, they want to do, but they're purposeful. They are planned. Um, it's not just any activity. It's, it's activities that relate to a theme. It could be activities related to a game model. So if 
you have a game model and and one of your you know things about you know uh, your game model is um you know not losing possession in the defending third well then maybe you have a game that brings that out and working on improving possession in the middle third or the defending third so again you have a list of activities related to your game model maybe you have a list of scenarios for them to practice so i have a high school team as i mentioned this is these are the high school kids I printed out some some cards for them, and on the cards there are scenarios, different scenarios. So you can see here they're reading and, and they're uh, kind of discussing what it looks like. And then at the end, I brought them all in, and I said, "All right, let's let's read all the scenarios and choose which one you want to do as a whole team." And they chose uh, this one, which was basically scoring from a corner. And the other situational games, which, by the way, I'm more than happy if anybody listens to this, if they want to email me, I, I'll send them a whole deck of these situational games. Um, but they had a choice to be the attacking team or the defending team. And if they were the attacking team, this was their task. They were down one to two. They had to score. They had to first off score off a corner kick. They have to earn it, though. So they would play. I gave them like 10 minutes or so, seven minutes on this, but I gave them about 10 minutes and they had to earn a corner. Before though, they went on the field, I told them, go create a corner kick. Create a corner kick that when you you earn it, you go ahead and you run. And I think as coaches, sometimes we have in mind what the corner kicks want we want them to look like, which is great. You're the coach, getting paid a lot of money uh, from some clubs, but you'll be surprised what they come up with. And then on the defending side, how would you defend that corner? So then we would go and play. Uh, they really enjoyed it. And uh, it's always a good thing when they say, coach, can we do that again sometime? So here, uh, a couple weeks ago, well, actually a couple months ago, sorry, we did our coaching convention, uh, United Soccer Coaches in Kansas City. And I, I actually presented this concept on the field. And what I did is I gave the kids a choice of activities. So these are two activities related to attacking. The one on the top left is one that's more of a group attacking activity. The one on the lower left is more of an individual activity. So I gave them the choice and I put them in small groups, put them in two teams, and I had these big laminated cards, which I'll show you what they look like on the next slide, or sorry, next two slides. Um, and I said, which one of these two do you want to do to get better at attacking? And they chose the Barcelona game. And I said, well, why did you choose? And they said, well, I'm sitting out. And we're all, like, involved. And I thought that was really, it was really, from a coaching standpoint, I would, I'd love to hear that because they, they want to be inclusive of all their team, teammates. So, and they're playing a game. Anytime you have two goals, one goal on one end, one goal on the other end, and it looks like a game, they usually have a lot more fun. So, and these were the defending ones. So I gave them again, kind of a small group activity, defending one, which is on the lower left-hand corner. I gave them more of a group activity, which is on the uh, upper left-hand corner. So we did a defending one as well. I did this, this was a group of about, I think there were under 12 uh, players and the parents were in the audience and uh, they were actually quite surprised what the kids came up with. So again, you have in mind what you want to work on and whether or not you want to do an individual activity, small group, large group, or you want to work on something from your game model or something that's just uh, related to getting better, you come in with the plan. You come in with these activities. So this is how it looks. I apologize for my bedspread. This is actually our spare bedroom and it's in just a spare bedroom. Uh, uh, top, but I basically, I laminate the cards. So these are laminated. I printed them out and I gave them to the kids and, um, spread them out. So that's kind of what it looks like on how you can prepare like a, some activities and have them choose from activities. But again, it's not just willy nilly. It's they're prepared. As we go on with autonomy, supportive coaching practices, and one of the reasons why is so you, we can create an athlete-centered environment. 
is we got it. We have to give rationale for tasks. And um, it's really important that we <laughs> explain why so we don't have question after question after question why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and I'm dating myself with this little graphic here and uh, with Horshack from Welcome Back Carter. But if you remember the show, Welcome Back Carter would always talk about something and then he would have a question um, or he might have an answer to uh, one of uh, Mr. Carter's questions. So um, the point is, is that can you show them what to do, how to do it, but then when you get to the why, that really is it hits in the bullseye. That really hits the target. When players know why they're doing what they're doing and and, and that it's purposeful, now you're you're creating more of an athlete-centered environment as opposed to as opposed to a coach-driven one. Um, acknowledge your feelings and perceptions. So um, as coaches, again, you're the coach. You're getting some of us are getting paid a lot of money. Some of us are are voluntold and and uh, basically, we're just kind of recruited to, to coach. But as a coach, it's important that we seek first to understand as opposed to being understood. And, you know, I, I'm sure my wife is probably like, yeah, Vince, you need to, you know, um, understand this quote, too. But so I, I think sometimes when we talk to players, we expect that they're listening when in reality they might not. They might have questions. So afterwards, we, you know, kind of confirm that they understand what we're talking about or check for understanding, if you will. But um, if they do have a question or if they need clarification, we should, you know, listen um, with empathy and listen with uh, intent. And even sometimes you, you might rephrase or repeat something that they said just so you understood what they're asking. And because again, that's part of creating an athlete centered environment. So by giving them autonomy and the freedom and the courage, uh, the, you know, allowing them and creating an environment to ask questions, uh, it goes a long way to creating these autonomy, supportive coaching, uh, behaviors. And we solicit athlete input. So sometimes as coaches, we, you know, we think we have all the answers, but they're the ones playing in between the white lines. So I'm sure a lot of coaches do this intuitively. Uh, they might go to one of their players and say, all right, what are you seeing? You know, what do you see out there? What do you think we need to work on? And you need to, if we can, as coaches, can we create a circle of trust? Um, in other words, everything that's inside the circle, right, is valuable and is valued and and um, we we uh, we value your input. So what do we need to do to get better? What do, you know? How can we together solve this problem? And I think as coaches, we always want to kind of impose. Some of us want to impose our will upon uh, you know what they're what they're doing. When a lot of times, if you just ask them, they'll give you some good answers. Um, even young kids will, I mean, one thing about that's true about young kids is that they have no filter whatsoever. So <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, th they'll tell you maybe a little bit too much if you ask for their input. But when I, for example, I ask them, you know, which game you want to play, the five and six is red light, green light, or uh, sharks and minnows. They said sharks and minnows. And then I would, then what I did is I followed up and I said, well, how, how can we make this harder? And you know, I knew kind of what I was thinking, but they came up with something a little different. But that was actually pretty cool, which was um, they added uh, just some more like they added someone like the stand and they were like seaweed and you can't touch the seaweed. It was actually pretty, pretty neat. Um, one young man came up with that. Avoid controlling behaviors. Uh, I think, again, if you want to create an athlete centered environment or an environment where players have some autonomy to learn, to ask questions, to get better. We as coaches need to avoid these controlling behaviors. And this might be, uh, it's meant to be kind of a funny example, but in the last season of Ted Lasso, which is a wonderful show, which uh, is basically about creating an athlete center environment, 
I think it's a must see for all uh, all coaches of any sport. And you have Roy Ken in here, who's coaching this youth, uh, you know, young girls team, and he's basically in control, and they know it. And he pretty much, you know, uh, uses some words that you probably shouldn't use with, well, you shouldn't at all use with kids. But it's a controlling environment. So it's, you know, and I think sometimes as coaches, we we want to control the environment because that's what people think a coach does. Well, a really good coach is more of a guide on the side as opposed to being a sage on the stage. So these next pictures, um, the pictures on these slides is basically a night a reason why we don't want, want to avoid controlling behaviors as coaches. We got to be careful saying you must strike the ball this way. You must receive the ball this way. You have to receive the ball this way. Well, what if that way it's not comfortable for them, but the way they're doing it works. So for example, the player in the left top left-hand corner, that's Jamal Wilkes, who was coached by the legendary John Wooden. And his shooting technique is really not correct. I mean, it, it's, it's he had a just a weird wind up, and his, the ball would always go back behind his head. But he was pretty accurate with the shooting. As was the player on the right hand side, Larry Bird. Um, you know, who if you look at his technique, his feet are actually pointing incorrectly, um, and he usually used to shoot sideways, and and he rarely followed through. And then the one on the bottom is Louis Tiant, who I used to love watching him, and his windup was really unique. But um, how he delivered the pitch was always um, always pretty solid. So uh, there are a lot of coaches that have tried to correct players' techniques, and the player just can't handle it. But yet they can. If they come up with their own technique and it's effective, who cares at the end of the day? So can we kind of get in our minds that, you know, there's there's certain things that go into the technique of doing something. But at the end of the day, we got to give the players autonomy to kind of figure out how to do that and what's comfortable for them. Um, so one way of, of kind of tying that in is it's what's called external focus of attention. So when I, because I live in Indiana and basketball is a religion, uh, I played basketball when I was a kid. I still, I actually still do uh, every now and again. So my dad, when he's teaching me how to shoot a basketball, he said, all right, Vince, when you shoot a basketball, point your elbow to the basket, uh, um, you know, and then get, get like arch on the ball. He used to say oomph, get oomph on the ball. In other words, make it look like the McDonald's M and make sure that the ball spins backwards. So you have backspin. So what I did is I learned that if the ball didn't have backspin, then I didn't follow through right. I didn't put my hand in the hoop or whatever. I didn't follow through with my wrist correctly. Um, if the if the shot was flat, I didn't put enough oomph or arch on the ball. In other words, External focus is the effect of the technique, whereas coaches, a lot of times we focus on the internal parts of a, of, a, of a technique. For example, when you strike the ball, strike the ball with your laces, put your non-kicking foot next to the ball, get your head and shoulder uh, and knees over the ball as you strike it, land on your shooting foot. Or we can just say, when you strike the ball, see if you can get little to no spin on the ball. See if you can make that happen. So if we went back to the video that I showed earlier, what I told the kids, I said, if you're, if you're working on bending the ball with your foot, try to just work on it with a teammate and make the ball spin sideways. So they were allowed to explore and experiment how to make the ball spin sideways. I didn't tell them that they, you know, they, they slice, you know, they kind of, strike the ball off to the center of the right or to the left. Um, I didn't tell them how to, you know, toe up, heel down. I didn't tell them any of that. I just said, try and make the ball spin sideways and, and uh, see if you can do that. So I've been using external focus of attention a lot, even with little kids. Um, 
So there are some examples um, for dribbling. Like when you dribble, keep the ball under your knee. Can you keep the ball under your knee? So then that way they know when they're dribbling, it's not really the mechanics. It's, oh, the ball's under my knee. Or another one I use is, can you keep the ball within a hula hoop of your body? And even the five and six-year-old kids know what a hula hoop is. And so I just said, all right, pretend there's a hula hoop on the ground and you're right in the middle of it. Can you keep the ball in that hula hoop? So now that's the effect of the technique. If the ball's outside that hula hoop, then they know that it's they took too big of a touch. Or you can say take small or big touches. Uh, let the foot hug the ball. These are all external. Turn your headlights on. In other words, instead of saying getting your head up, I just can you say, hey, let's turn your headlights on. Passing, strike the ball in the nose. Um, that could be actually a little bit internal as well. Make your foot as flat as a board. Um, so I can see, for example, if my foot is flat as a board and if I hit the ball in the nose and the ball will roll as flat as a board, that's external focus. If the ball isn't rolling flat, then maybe I hit the ball underneath or I hit the ball too much on the top. So it's bouncing a little bit. So I need to correct that. So external focus of attention is is um, just allowing the players to experiment on how to mechanically do something better, but not like telling them this is exactly how you do it. Now, eventually, might you need to get to internal focus? Yes. You might have to say, okay, so when you use your toe to strike the ball, the ball didn't go straight. The ball kind of curved off to the left or to the right. So. What if we use the biggest part of our foot, which is the laces or the inside of our foot, and now I bet the ball will go a little bit more straight. So that's internal. So you you do, they kind of go hand in hand, but sometimes players learn easier when you just focus on the external focus part, the external part of it. So when I used to strike a ball, I had an English soccer coach and he just said, Vince, when you strike it, try to have little to no spin on it. In other words, make it knuckle, make it like a knuckleball in baseball. And so I would just work on, I would just strike a ball against a wall and I would work on trying to get little to no spin or top spin when I shoot the ball. So that's external focus. That's giving players autonomy to find their technique, to find what works for them. Um, this is from the poem, The Youth Soccer Coach. And it's basically kind of summing up a little bit, you know, where, uh, you know, Derek, Diego Maradona, which, by the way, he wrote this poem and it's a timeless piece written by the late, late Mike Berticelli. He used to coach University of Notre Dame. He was my mentor and he was my my friend. And I wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for him today. But he wrote this poem after the 1986 World Cup because he was inspired by Diego Maradona. And he was wondering why in the world, with a country of our size, do we not have any of these types of players on the men's side? And we do on the women's side. But basically, it's just saying that, you know, no coach taught these moves while, while being uh, demeaning towards him. He was he just basically learned by playing with his friends, copying others. So in other words, he'd watch how someone would strike a ball and he'd like, yeah, I'm going to try and strike it that way. Um, there's another part of the poem that says imagination is needed on, on the part of each child. Solving problems on the field is what makes them go wild. That's another part of the poem that gets into a little bit of autonomy, supportive coaching practices where we allow them. We need to allow them to solve problems on the field. Um, as a coach, here's some more autonomy, supportive practice coaching uh, behaviors. Can you plan in small group time? So, for example, after you make a coaching point, can you say, or after you, maybe you don't even make a coaching point. After you do an activity, you say, okay, we just did that activity. Now get in small groups and or all the defenders get together, all the midfielders get together. Come up with one way you want to get better on the next time we play this. Um, build time for them to reflect. Um, you know, have, maybe, maybe they have a journal. Um, build time in them to practice individually or with a teammate. Uh, letting them come up with solutions, uh, seeing what they come up with, because they might surprise you. So when in our in our courses, United Soccer Coaches, we use 
when we when we assess or evaluate a training session, we use the mnemonic score. And so when we kind of self-reflect, we look at you should always ask yourself, OK, the setup of the activity, was it safe? Um, would the players just learn from the session? So a really good session or a really good activity, if you were you couldn't talk, you had laryngitis. But the setup of the activity was simple and the uh, the game was easy to kind of explain and, and understand. They would just learn through playing uh, as opposed to all your coaching points. Uh, C is challenging. Is it Was it too challenging? Was it challenging enough? Um, was it too simple? Because if it's if it's too challenging, interference starts to come in their minds. There's a phrase from the inner game of tennis, potential minus interference equals performance. So every child has potential. Every team has potential. As coaches, can we reduce or eliminate interference so they can perform? Well, if something's too challenging for them, can we simplify it? If it's too easy, how can we make it a little bit more challenging for them? So I um, just want to let you know you got five minutes. I'm almost done. Opportunities. Um, do they have opportunities to participate? It was, was Were all of your activities inclusive? Um, were your activities realistic? Were, was it realistic to their age and abilities? Um, educate, did you apply universal design learning? In other words, did you apply teaching strategies that uh, the visual learner can can learn from. So, for example, those those activities that I print out in laminated cards, I found that some of the kids just like looking at those activities, and they say, "Oh, okay, now I understand the activity, coach." So, and just when you go back and you reflect, these are things that uh, that you should do. How and how do you score yourself? Have your own scoring method, mechanism. So. The idea of autonomy, supportive coaching is something I'm sure a lot of coaches that are listening have already been doing. Um, but it's really brave to do something like in the middle of practice where you say, OK, you've got eight minutes to be great. You've got eight minutes to practice on what you want to work on. You can do it with a teammate. You can do it with teammates. You just can't like, you know, uh, shoot on goal and just see what happens. It, that's brave, you know, and, and uh, I think sometimes as coaches, we have to kind of embrace those times. So, um, and I'm almost done as a coach. Can we create memories or moments? So can we create memories where players look back and say, you know what, my coach gave me some autonomy to get better. Um, she or he wasn't just so demanding where everything was scripted and there, it was their way or the highway. Um, and as a coach, I think, you know, you always should say yes to the S's. Yes to safety, yes to, miles, yes to skills, yes to sweat, which doesn't mean running them until they drop. It means that they're active and, and yes to simple. And if I think if we say yes to the yeses, we create this autonomy, supportive coaching um, type uh, behaviors to where we create an athlete-centered environment. So um, these are my references. If anybody wants the slide deck, I'm more than happy to share the slide deck slide deck with them but um i am uh, i'm done i will stop sharing and and uh answer any questions that people might have absolutely thanks so much um if you have a question for vince now's a chance to get it in your chat box vince we do have one i'm just going to start with from belford said he loves the quote understand as opposed to being understood mm -hmm. is this your quote i'd like to use it and give you credit if you came up with it no no i i think that's a, yeah. Um, I think Stephen Covey said it actually. And one of the best Ted talks I've ever, ever, my favorite Ted talk of all time is Rita Pearson. Um, every child's a champion. And she, she uses this quote in that Ted talk. It's like a nine minute Ted talk. And it, every time I watch it, it just gives me chills. Um, it's just fantastic. So I can't take credit for that. No, no way. One question I had, well, I have two questions. One is about technique. You talked about allowing allowing youth to develop their own technique if it works for them. But at the same time, if you are in in coach education, you go to clinics. There is a there is a correct way to teach technique, and typically it's because it is effective, mm -hmm. and it's also 
less likely to cause injury. Yes. Where do you find the balance between, you know what, this is how it works for them, let them do it, versus we really need to fix this. And and I know it's going to take time, but you're doing it incorrectly. Yeah, I think it's a I think there's a it's a balance, to be honest with you. I think there are times related to age or develop the stage of uh, development. Where, yeah, I think well, right? yeah, it's a good question. I think age is part of it. I think when they're young, I mean, just give them simple things, right? Big touches, little touches. Um, you know, because from a physical standpoint, you know, pushing the ball with their laces, toe down at an angle, you know, that that's tough for a five year old to grasp. You know, but if you just tell uh, she or he, hey, keep the ball within a hula hoop's distance of your body or keep it within a hula hoop, they can figure that out. I think when it becomes a problem, like when it becomes, you know, when they receive the ball and the first touch is, is too is too heavy. Okay, now, okay, let's talk about the mechanics of doing it, right? So now let's, let's learn how to do it, All right, A little bit better. So I think if there's a balance in there. And from what I read, External focus is really good for novice players, mm-hmm. right? Letting them, letting them kind of learn and explore. But, and as you get older, internal focus actually makes more sense because now you can, okay, if I didn't have enough, if I, if the shot had, didn't have, had too much spin on the ball, I have to internally correct how I struck the ball. Um, it's like, if you watched uh, the Joe Montana special on Peacock, he said during the game, it was like one of the Super Bowls. He was like, I need to work on my three foot drop, my three step drop. <laughs> Here he is in, in the Super Bowl and he's talking about he's working about his internal mechanics on on how to do it. But I think it's a balance. I think there are times when the player is panicking or they're frustrated or they're I can't do this. OK, then you might you're going to have to show them how to do it. Mm. So it is done correctly. Mm. And like you said, uh, that it doesn't cause injury because that's a big yeah. part. Of it too. But I yeah. think the younger they are it's okay the more to let them explore a little bit. I might, I might also suggest it's not necessarily age, but experience level. Yep. Because, you know, I, I work some of the, some of the clients I work with in coaching tend to be elderly and yeah. maybe taking up the sport for the first time. And so that internal, just because, just because they're a senior citizen doesn't mean they know how to internalize a movement. Yes. And, and if I can give that external direction, um, that really helps them. Second question, when when we're talking about autonomy with, with players, um, cognitive ability is a factor in this. Mm-hmm. Because if I'm, if I'm pr- maybe providing some democracy to a group of nine-year-olds versus a group of 16-year-olds, right. we may not get the same output or the same thought processes. You talked about the players kind of developing their own game or, or adapting what you taught. We don't necessarily see that in younger. So how do you determine whether you need to be more, more demo- you were allowed to be more democratic versus yeah. more autocratic of, no, this is how we're doing it. Yeah. It's again, I, I've always found it's a balance, um, but I do the great by choice with eight, nine year olds. I just don't do it every practice. I, I mm-hmm. might do it every two, I may every two weeks. Like with the high school kids, we do it every two weeks. And I only did it because they said, Coach, that was awesome. We want to do that some more. Mm-hmm. I had one kid said, Coach, can we? Can I just run because I'm not fit? I don't know if that's the best thing to tell your high school coach, that you're not fit. But I said, sure. If you want to run, just take somebody with you. Um, but I, I, there are times, yes, when you are the coach. You know this is what we need to work on. If we can give them some autonomy in there, great. Um, but in the end, in the end, you're also the one that's steering the ship as well. But if we can give some of this up to them a little bit here and there, not all the time, this isn't all the time. It's mm-hmm. every now and again, it's, Hey, do you want to do a three V three tournament or a four V four tournament? Which one, you know, or, um, just kind of give them some autonomy of practice. And it's not, I think a lot of times people associate like with being lazy, well, no, you're being lazy. Again. No, <laughs> well, there's a lot of, if you do it right, there's a purpose behind it. There's a method to the madness. So um, I think, yeah, I, I think as well, there, there may be a challenge with, with kids who have that autonomy to maybe work on things that they're good at because they know they're good at them yep. as opposed to, I'm going to work on something that I'm terrible at. Yeah. And I'm going to right. myself here. Right. 
Right. Yep. And that's okay too. I think that's okay too. Um, you know, if, if they are, you know, if they're really good at, at, you know, dribbling the ball, then okay. Practice some more moves. If, um, so again, it, it just, it, the age thing is, it's interesting. I do give them, uh, ideas, you mm-hmm. know, I'd say, all right, you might have to play soccer. You, know, you want to play soccer tennis. I might, and I show, I show them soccer tennis. Um, we play a little game called horseshoes uh, with the high school boys. They know it, but on my high school boys team, but the little kids, they won't know it. Um, mm-hmm. and it might not be appropriate for them. So, uh, there are times when, yes, look, this is what we're doing today. You know, you know, but still, but the other parts of it are really important, like soliciting their input or listening to them. Right. Um, Because there's a saying Tony Dungy used to say, you can be demanding without being demeaning, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and and I think that's part of this too, and create an athlete center environment. Yeah. Yeah. Vince, thank you so much for, for sharing a little bit of your expertise and I hope everybody watching enjoyed it, whether you're watching live or, Uh, on our YouTube channels. And just a reminder to like and subscribe wherever you're watching from so you get notified for more presentations. We have two more coming up tomorrow, Uh, yours truly being one of them. So you absolutely need to come back for that. Um, But uh, just kidding. Um, I hope hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks again, Vince, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.